we move to Acts chapter 9. Today we are finishing um, the last of that chapter. I know we have not met for like two weeks. So today we pick up from where we left. Last time I was here, we were looking at uh, the miraculous healing that Peter did to Aeneas the paralytic. Aeneas the paralytic man who had been bedridden for how many years? Eight years. And then Peter tells him to get up and roll his mat. And immediately he was healed and he took up his mat and walked. So today we look through Acts chapter 9 verse 36 to 43. So I would like us to go right there. This evening we are reading from Acts chapter 9 verse 36 to 43. And I have titled that session, Stepping Out in Faith. Stepping Out in Faith. Okay? So this is what the Word of God says, Acts 9, 36 to 43. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became ill and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida, they sent out two men to him and asked him, please come at once. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by her hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, when we read a passage in Scripture or in the Bible, the one of the questions that we should ask ourselves is, does this sound familiar? Does this sound familiar? And so, does this sound familiar? Like something you've read before. For example, can you see a parallel between, I know I mentioned this on Sunday, the healing, this healing story here, with the healing of the girl who was healed by Jesus, the daughter to Jairus, in Mark chapter 5, verse 35. Because it's important when you're lead, reading the scripture to listen and ask yourself, how common is this? What does this sound like? Because there are many lessons you draw in relating scripture and scripture. Praise the Lord. So I want us to draw some similarities between the encounter we have here about Peter bringing back to life Tabitha and Jesus bringing back to life, not healing, the lady, the girl. We do not know her name. We will just see her called Talitha Kum, little girl, wake up. Mark chapter 5, verse 35 to 43. I want us to draw the similarity. So I want you to come with me to Mark chapter 5. We are just building our ground into this text. Mark chapter 5, verse 35 to 43. This is the encounter of Jesus bringing back to life the daughter who belonged to Jairus. Jairus was a synagogue leader. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. They said, your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, do not be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, Naskia Peter Akwapo, James and John, the brother of James. John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, 
why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to tell anyone, to let anyone know about this, and told them to give her something to eat. Let's draw some similarities here between this encounter and the encounter that we have seen Peter and Tabitha. In both stories, a messenger is sent with a request for help. Sindio? Okay. In both stories, women are being brought back to life. There's the dead girl, there's the dead lady, Tabitha. These are two women. In both cases, the person is dead and people are weeping. Actually, for this girl, we are they were mourning and wailing. And for Peter, the widows are crying and wailing as well. In both cases, the situation seems hopeless. With Jesus, they are asking, they are telling the, the synagogue leader, Jairus, do not waste your time. The child is already dead. Hopeless. The case with Tabitha, they have already prepared him for burial. They have already washed him and put him where? In the upstairs room, getting ready to be buried. The situation is hopeless. In both cases, Jesus puts the mourners outside, and the same applies to Peter. He tells everybody, get outside. Both Jesus and Peter speak just a few words. Talitha, come. Little girl, wake up. And for Peter, he says very, very short words again. He just says, Tabitha, get up. Okay? The girl and Dockers both get up and are shown to others. So there's no doubt they are alive. Okay? And actually in both cases, Jesus held the girl's hand and Peter also held Tabitha's hand. He took her by her hand and helped her to her feet. Jesus did the same thing. She took the little girl's hand and everybody saw that these two women were alive. And in both stories, there's amazement. And people believe in the Lord. Because remember I said, I think in, in Acts chapter 3, that if in our preaching, in our gospel message, if the response is people praising us and saying, oh, how great a preacher Pastor Rachel is, we have failed the test. The response must always go back to God. People must believe in the Lord. People must glorify the Lord. Praise the Lord. And this happens exactly in these two stories. As with Jesus, the, the healings or both, they enhance spiritual authority. Okay? They enhance spiritual authority. They show how powerful the healing power of Jesus Christ is. And part of why we are asking ourselves this evening, if something sounds familiar, is because we want to see the connection between how God has acted before and how God is acting now in the apostolic age. And we are being reminded in this story today and in the story of Jesus bringing back that girl to life that God can bring life out of death. Even in situations that may seem hopeless, in which people might think that it's not possible. You cannot expect anything. So maybe you are sitting here and there's something completely dead in your life. And you're saying nothing good can come out of this. My brother and sister, God may surprise you if you step out in faith and hold on to hope. So remember that if you forget anything else I say this evening. God may surprise you if you step out in faith and hold on, on to hope. And I want you to start thinking as we speak, what is that situation in your life which seems dead? Fruitless. As if nothing can, can bear fruit. Something which is impossible in your sight. 
and in human standards. If you step out in faith, the Lord may just surprise you like he surprised the widows who had just lost Tabitha. Okay? Now, that was a little background. The scripture begins by telling us where this takes place. It says in Joppa. In Joppa, there was a disciple called Tabitha. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Joppa. And we are told Joppa was 45 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And Joppa was the main port in Israel. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Some of you may remember that uh, it was the city to which the reluctant prophet Jonah went when he sought to escape from his God-given mission to take God's word to non-Jewish citizen of the city of Nineveh. This, the, it was the capital of God's enemies. Nineveh. And God is sending Jonah. And when Jonah is sent, he decides to escape to go to Tarshish. So he goes to board a boat in Joppa. You, it is very important for you to, to get the same. Let me read for you what happens to Jonah. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. We will get the encounter of Jonah in Joppa. Just like uh, Peter is healing or is bringing back to life Tabitha in Joppa. This is what it says. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. Okay, verse 1 says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh. This, this was the capital city of enemies of God. And preach against it. Because its wickedness has come up before me. But what happens to Jonah, verse 3? But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed to Tarshish. So we are saying Joppa was the main port in Israel. Was the main port in Israel. This, and this is the city where Tabitha lives and where uh, Peter goes to to minister, to do this miracle. Okay? And in Acts chapter 10, the next chapter that we are going to read next week, there's a story of another person there. Peter will be commissioned by the same God to carry the good news about Jesus from this city of Joppa to a Gentile called Cornelius, a Roman centurion of the Italian cohort. So from Joppa, this is where Peter is going to receive the message to go to another Gentile called Cornelius. Just like Jonah was sent to go and preach from Joppa to the Ninevites. Rather, and he runs away and boards a ship or a boat in Joppa. Not only that, we know that from Matthew 16, 17, that Peter's Aramaic name was Simon Bar Jonah. Simon, son of Jonah. You can go back and read. Simon, son of Jonah. It is not a coincidence. Doesn't mean that he was Jonah's son, but the name is so closely related. Jonah's God, brothers and sisters, is Peter's God. The same God who sent Jonah is the one who is going to give uh, Peter a task. And in the book of Acts, we will repeatedly learn that God's concern has always extended beyond just one person to all people, and especially the Gentiles, the people who are outcasts. So the detail of this story takes place in Joppa. And it is very important that we note that, that this is taking place in Joppa and not in any other place. Now, the Bible tells us that in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha. It is very important to understand Tabitha. Tabitha, who is also known as Dorcas. Her Greek name is Dorcas. And the translation of that name, both names mean a gazelle. Both Tabitha and Dorcas mean a gazelle. 
and usually we usually say in English as graceful as a gazelle. You see? So she was really graceful. So please note that her name in Aramaic is Tabitha, but that name in Greek is Dorcas. And I think here we are given more. Yeah, actually, in Joppa there was a disciple called Tabitha. That is Aramaic. And we are told in Greek her name is Dorcas. Now the translation is Gazelle. I do not know the meaning of your name. Okay, I do not know. You can go. I'm sure you know the meaning of your name. So that is Tabitha Dorcas, translated the gazelle. And please note, it is very important for you to know that this is the only place in the New Testament where the feminine form of the Greek word for disciple is used. It is the only place in the New Testament, you know we come to this service to learn, Sindio Kusoma, where the feminine form of the Greek word for disciple is used. And it is the only place where Tabitha is mentioned. After here, Utawa iskia jinayake tena. She comes and disappears. But she is the only woman in the New Testament called a disciple. Are we together? And this Greek word for her is called, the Greek word is Mathetria. Mathetria. A male disciple like Peter and John and the rest are called Mathetai. Bwana sifiwe. Mathetai. That is a male disciple. But the only time that Mathetria is used in the New Testament is when it is describing Tabitha. The other women will be, will be called and there were other women. Like uh, in, in uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 3, you will see Jesus was walking, preaching, and other women were following. Mary Magdalene, Mary and all that. You will see many women mentioned in the New Testament. Wakina Salome, akuna moja a little disciple, a lady disciple, a, no one. Only Tabitha. The only Mathetria. So those other women, the women are called Gune. So you will see Gune and other Gune and Gune were following Jesus. But for this particular one, when you read this Bible in Greek here, you will see in Joppa there was a Mathetria. There was a disciple. The same name for for, for Peter and John, it's just that this one is now a lady, Mathetria. And this is very profound. Because when you consider the relationships between men and women in the first century at this time, they were very unequal. Women were looked down upon. Actually, when they were counting people, women were not counted. Jesus, when he fed the 5,000, it says 5,000 men. The, men and the, the women and children were not counted. Even when I said on Sunday that when Peter preached 3,000 people, those were 3,000 men. They did not count women. A Jew prayed every day when he woke up in the morning. You know what he said? He thanked God that number one, he was not a Gentile. Number two, he was not a dog. And number three, he was not a woman. That is a Jewish man. I thank God, I thank you, imagine, that I'm not a Gentile, I'm not a dog, and I'm not a woman. So, when you see in this culture, Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, calling Tabitha Mathetria, in a culture where women were despised, where women were equal to dogs. This is very profound for this lady. You have to respect Tabitha. She is a disciple. And she earned the name because of what she was doing. Okay? This is the only example of how in the new community that grew around Jesus... No one is staying in his or her place. People are going beyond boundaries. And that is what happens when we come to Jesus Christ. He changes our background. He changes the names we have been given. And he gives us new 
reputable names. Tabitha is Mathetria, a female disciple. Now, something else. In the first century, widows tended to be poor because she was a minister to, to, the, to, the, to the widows. There were poor people at the bottom rank of the society without anyone to represent them or protect them. And these are the ones whom Tabitha, the Madetria, the Gazelle, gave life to. They are the ones that this lady took care of and well known for her good works of generosity and charity, she dies. And messengers race to Peter and urge him to come without delay. Think of the optimistic grace that is presented in these women. They are very optimistic. They are very positive women. Believing and hoping that a dead woman, already washed and laid out for burial, can be brought back to life by Peter. They are stepping out in faith. Praise the Lord. They are stepping out in faith. Tabitha's absence would leave a big hole. It had already left a big gap. And we have seen that what are the women doing? They are crying. They are crying and showing Peter the clothes. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. She was their source of hope. She, she, she was their comforter. She is the one who contended for them when nobody cared about them. First of all, they were women. Secondly, they were widows, forgotten by the society. And the only person they could hope in had just died. So they cry. They are mourning. They are in pain. They are hopeless. It is very hard for faith communities to lose key leaders. In Tabitha's case, one who helped the church fulfill its responsibility to care for its widows. So Tabitha steps out in time and in faith because she put her time resources and energy into helping those who needed it the most. She was an instrument of God's love and care for widows and she gave herself her time, her skill, her money in generous ways. That is why she was so loved and respected. She was devoted to doing good works. That is what the Bible says and acts of charity and as followers of Jesus Christ. We are called to do the same. James 1.27 reminds me that religion that God considers as poor, pure is what? I wish they could show me right there because that has just come. James 1.27, religion that God considers pure is to take care of what? Orphans. And widows. There it is. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Imagine. That is what God considers as true worship. Imagine. Taking care of widows and orphans. And Tabitha knew that very well. And we are called to do the same. And brothers and sisters, you know charity is not just giving out a donation. But in Christian terms, it involves esteem, affection, caring that reflects God's agape, self-giving love. Works of charity are not only done with money. It can be done, being, being done with words, with our time. And our help to our family or neighbors. Tabitha stepped out in faith and impacted our whole community. We do not know in this story whether she was married. We are not told. We do not know about having a husband or whatever or children. But she steps out in faith. Now, if you remember in the book of Acts, chapter 6, there was a little controversy because the non-Jewish widows were complaining that they were being neglected in the church's distribution of food. Do you remember? In Acts chapter 6, 
And that is where we get uh, the deacons appointed to distribute food to them. After that, controversy was solved. Peter now is uh, faced with another controversy of weeping widows. In chapter 6, he solved that eh, by appointing people to distribute food because they were complaining. But right here, he comes face to face with the, the defender of widows again is dead. Quite a challenge. And he has to perform his first uh, resurrection miracle. And I don't think I've seen any other for Peter. I think this was the only one and only where he brings somebody back to life. So Peter is emphatic and direct because he is confronted with widows again. When he hears they are lamenting, he sends them outside. And what does he do? He knelt down and prayed. That is what we read. Peter knelt down and prayed. He sent them out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. You know, you can just read those words. He knelt down and prayed and just pass it. Peter had to step out in faith. And I'm sure we all have lots of people and situations we are praying for. But this one was a tall order with very high expectations. They are expecting him to bring back that lady to life. On one hand, she's already dead. So how much worse can it get? On the other hand, how do you pray for something that seems so difficult, so unlikely, and so overwhelming? That is what Peter is battling with. And he kneels down. You know, kneeling down is an act of humility. Surrender before the Lord. We kneel before situations that seem too tough for us to handle. But kneeling is also a way into which we tap into the power of God. We are humbling before his power and surrendering. And he prayed and looked at the body. You know he's praying to a body. He is talking to a dead body. And he says, Tabitha, get up. Which reminds us what we have just seen. And John 11, where Jesus brings back Lazarus to life. Peter's power to heal is not magic. But a function of his close relationship with Christ. Who is risen in power and glory. And who raises dead people to life. Peter returns Tabitha to the saints. And widows. And presenting her to them alive. The result, what happens, we have read, people did what? They come to believe in the Lord. And as almost happens in Acts, when God's power is displayed, he took her by a hand and helped her to a fit. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. What, what kind of jubilation do you think happened in that place? I do not know how those, those women celebrated this became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Apostolic message. The word has gotten home. Many people, they did not just get amazed, but they believed in the Lord. And the final verse may seem like an, a useless verse for you, an important detail, but it isn't. It says in verse 43, Peter stayed in Joppa for some time. With who? With Atana. Named Simon. Atana is a shoe cobbler. Fundi wa viatu, sindio? And in this case, uh, he's not a very important person. He's not a very liked person in the Jewish community. Peter is a Jew. The Tana is a Gentile. I want you to, to differentiate that. To Jewish people, Atana, a shoe cobbler, was literally an outcast. Why? Because Jewish law regarded the work as defiling, since it required was, he wanted to mere ngozi, animal carcasses. So he is using, he's touching dead animals, blood, and skins, which were usually unclean. And like you would, you would agree with me, they really smelled bad. Is it a skin? See, in a smell, we buy. So for a Jew, a Jew would not come anywhere close to a cobbler or, or a tanner. 
but Simon, but Peter, who was born and raised as a Jew, would stay with Atana, not just for a night, but the Bible says for how long? For some time. What is he doing in the house of Atana? Weren't there Jews or other people he could have stayed with in Joppa? Why is he staying in a house of a person who is considered ritually unclean, an outcast? Why is he staying with such a person? Very significant. It shows that he had begun to disregard some of the practices and beliefs he had been taught and clung to since he was a boy. This was very important for his relationship with God. But Father, the bigger thing here is that uh, his stay with Simon the Tanner is preparing him for a greater ministry to the Roman centurion in chapter 10 called Cornelius. Because this is another Gentile. He is going to be sent to. Akiwa hapo tu kwa Simon the Tanner. He is going to receive a vision that he should go and speak to this person. And he is going to say, but Cornelius is a Gentile. And the discussion continues. So he is in a place of preparation. Are there people you have disregarded in your life? You, you cannot mix with. Jesus came to break religious barriers. Lessons learned. Number one, God may surprise you if you step out in faith and hold on to hope. Number two, as followers of Jesus, we are called to be devoted to good works and acts of charity. And I say charity is not just giving a small donation to a cause, but in Christian terms, it involves esteem, affection, and clearing, caring that reflects God agape, self giving love. Number three, we are called to step up in faith when we are faced with situations that seem too big for us. And we are to seek God's help. And lastly, our relationship to Jesus should change how we view and relate to people of different ethnic groups, tribes, color, and social strata. May the Lord bless you.